Welcome back to Planet Doug Behind the Scenes. This is for Monday, July 3rd, and I'm starting off in the hallway of my hotel. So this is going to be a walk and talk uh, behind the scenes video. Just taking the elevator down to the lobby. And uh, I always laugh when I get into an elevator, especially if I'm holding a camera, because I really like seeing elevators on uh, YouTube channels that I'm not familiar with because a brand new vlogger comes to Malaysia and I always want to know, you know, what kind of camera is he using? What kind of microphone? And they never, they never show it or talk about it, but in elevators, there's often a mirror. And if they go from their hotel room into the elevator, you always get a mirror shot and then I can see the camera that they're using. I find that uh, quite interesting. Just walking down the street outside my hotel, and if you look this direction, there's a uh, barber shop right there. That's where I got my hair cut a couple weeks ago. And uh, it was an interesting story because I saw them, I saw that little place for a long time with a sign that said hairstylist or whatever it says, but it was never open. Oh, <laughs> I'm completely confused about where I'm going. I'm going this way. Um, and it said hairstylist, but it was, never had anybody cutting hair. It was like filled with boxes and things. It was like a shipping company almost. But then one day I walked by and suddenly, oh, there's now a barber chair in there and they're busy cutting hair. So I got my hair cut and uh, the owner was telling me that, yeah, they had to shut down during the pandemic because his staff, I mean, he's, he was a Malaysian man and he's the owner, but his staff were all from uh, other countries and they couldn't come into the country anymore. Nobody could get a work visa at that time. So he just basically closed the place, but now he can get uh, people in. And I, I think, I forget now, the man who cut my hair there, he was either from India or from Sri Lanka. I'm not really sure, but yeah. Uh, life update haircut and uh, I still haven't decided how I'm getting back to Sumatra how I'm getting back to Bukatinghi as I mentioned in the previous video I've got three options I'm sort of thinking about simplest one is just to fly to Padang like basically get on a flight KL back to Bukatinghi the other option was to go back by ferry you know just travel down to Malacca hop on the ferry there go across to Dumai, kind of repeating my first ferry trip, except from Malacca instead of from Port Francis, and then uh, traveling overland from Dumai back to Bukatinghi. It would take longer, but perhaps more interesting. The only reason I'm hesitating about that is when I left from Port Dixon by ferry last time, I had a little bit of difficulty with Malaysian immigration leaving from the ferry port because it's an unusual way for foreigners to leave the country and because you're unusual immigration focuses on you he's like oh here's this tourist taking a ferry to Sumatra what's up with that and then they interview you and ask you a whole bunch of questions and that's never a pleasant experience you go through the airport you're just one of thousands per day so you're a more normal person if you're going in and out of the country by boat, I mean, they instantly become more interested in you. So leaving from Malacca by ferry, I'm just a little bit nervous about what that would mean in terms of going through immigration. Other than that, I think that would be my preferred choice. And uh, yeah, but we'll see what I end up doing. Right now, what I'm doing is something related to that trip because to go back to Sumatra, I need money and I want to get some Indonesian rupiah in advance. So I'm going on a walk to the nearby uh, Maybank building, I'm going to withdraw some money, get a Malaysian ringgit, and I'll change that into Indonesian rupiah while I'm here. So I always like to land in a new country with some of the local currency already in my pocket. It just makes life uh, so much easier. And I'm, ow, I'm sure there are a dozen ways of um, 
doing something like this that gives you a better exchange rate, uh, something, something, something. Oh, the lights aren't working here. I was wondering why the traffic was moving so awkwardly. But yeah, the traffic lights are out. So, yeah, they're doing a lot of uh, construction over here beside the uh, telecom museum. So they probably knocked out the traffic lights. Yeah, these ones have been knocked out as well. So, yeah. <laughs> as a pedestrian, I have to watch where I'm going even more than normal. You never know where somebody's going to be coming from now. I have to go that way. So. I'm just cross over here. But as I was saying, taking out ringgit here and then changing it to rupiah and then you know it probably i'm starting with canadian dollars in my bank account and then you know by withdrawing them from the atm i'm sure i lose on the exchange rate at every single step and there's there's always a smarter way of doing everything i ever do i just uh, can't worry about it too much anymore i just do what i do so yeah, I'm going up to the Maybank building to uh, withdraw money, but I'm going to do something else that's quite interesting because when I left from Taiwan a long time ago, how, I don't even know how many years ago it was now. Okay, is this bus going to pull over? Maybe, so. Yeah, it's one of these um, Go KL buses. This is the uh, purple line. Oh, I didn't realize they have a bus stop right there. That's kind of cool. But um, yeah, I still had an active bank account in Taiwan and I had to have one because the company I worked for, of course, they, they did direct deposit into your bank account. So I had a local bank account. And then uh, when I first left from Taiwan, I was occasionally doing some freelance work for them and that was kind of convenient because they could pay me. I mean, if you're working for someone in another country, it raises the issue of, well, how do you get paid? And since I still had my Taiwanese bank account, they could just continue to deposit freelance payments, you know, into my bank account. And uh, I haven't done that for a very long time, but lately, I've been thinking about dipping my toe into the world of online work. Um, I mean, I, I don't think of YouTube as work, you know, this is fun for me, everything I do on YouTube takes a lot of time and effort, and technically it's work, but uh, un unless you become a very popular YouTuber, it's not really paid work either, so that's the bigger problem. So I've been thinking of uh, what to do. And I'm thinking about, as I said, uh, diving into the world of becoming a remote worker, whatever work I can find online. Um, another a YouTuber that I know, a friend of Daryl, like Wander Eats Daryl, and he, uh, he knows another YouTuber, uh, Remote Darren. That's his YouTube channel, Remote Darren. And his name will give you an idea of what he's all about he's traveling around the world while working remotely. And he's, in the last year or two, he's expanded into developing a remote business of his own. Like rather than just working for other companies, he's developed a uh, website called The Remote Hive, Remote Hive. And um, it's kind of like a, I don't know how to describe it. He basically helps other people become remote workers, become a digital nomad, essentially. And he gives, uh, on his website, he provides a lot of advice, a lot of um, information. And he even has a podcast where, yeah, you know, in the podcast, he does the same thing. So, so I've been thinking along those lines lately. So I was actually looking at remote the Remote Hive, Remote Darren's uh, website, and reading a lot of the information there. And there are a lot of links there to companies where you can get an, open an account 
And then you basically list all the things you can do and then companies might contact you with a job or the companies will list jobs and you can bid on them or apply for them. I, I don't know how it all works. But as I said, I did this a little bit for my old company in Taiwan. And uh, yeah, it just made me remember this uh, bank account. And I was just curious, is this still open? I mean, I was surprised when I checked last time that it was still open, like years and years after I left from Taiwan with almost no money in that account, it was still open and still operational. I know that a bank account in Canada, they'll just shut it down. I mean, if there's not money flowing in and out of that account, the next time you check, it'll be gone. You know, they'll, they charge you a fee every month just for being a human and for breathing their oxygen. And before you know it, your account balance has gone below zero. And the next time they try to charge you a fee, there's no more money left in your account because they've already you know, consumed all of it, sucked it all out. And then uh, once the account reaches zero, they'll just close it. So the next time you check, your bank account will be gone. So that's what happens in Canada. But in uh, Taiwan, they seem much more flexible. And I think the chance of this bank account still being open and operational was, was maybe 25%. It's been so long and I haven't checked it. I haven't done anything with it for so long. So I would say 25% chance it's still open. 75% it's gone. But anyway, after I withdraw some money for Sumatra, I'm going to check uh, my own uh, bank account from Taiwan. Does it still exist? This is uh, Maybank, by the way. I always come here because I like to go to ATMs that are physically located at the bank. So if like if it sucks in my card and I don't get my card back or there's some other problem, there's someone I can go to talk to. So I don't like to go to like some random ATM at 7-Eleven or something. I always come to the main bank. And uh, yeah, they have a really nice uh, seven, I mean, Starbucks up here, which is kind of cool. All right, I'm gonna go do this and then we'll see what happens. My mind is blown. First of all, withdrawing money from my Canadian bank account, that went fine. I'm so nervous every time I do something like this, I'm scared to death, my heart is, beat is beating, pounding, because I just assume everything's gonna go wrong. It, all, it always seems to, though to be honest, it hasn't really gone wrong for a long time. I think, I guess I had an older bank card and whatever was going on with that card with my Canadian bank, it just set off, you know, it was just a, a problem constantly. And I, every time I go to an ATM, it would be, oh, there's a problem with your account, you know, please contact your bank. We have shut down all access to all of your accounts and you can't get any money and until you contact us and you try to contact them by phone, it ends up being a huge mess. So that's why I'm so nervous every time. I just expect the worst. But there was a point a couple of years ago now, I guess, where my card expired. I had to get a new ATM card. And ever since I got that, it's been a bit smoother. So I managed to withdraw some money. I'm never sure how much to ask for, though, because, again, I'm so nervous about these things. I never want to make any kind of a mistake where I have to backtrack. And I know there's some kind of a withdrawal limit associated with my ATM card or with my bank account or with that ATM. I don't know what the maximum is. So I'm trying to figure out like how much can I take out without setting off alarm bells or being denied. And they say, oh no, you know, that's beyond the daily limit or something. And then I have to do it again. And of course, if I do it two times in a row, then the Canadian security systems are just gonna like, oh my gosh, you know, Two times in Malaysia, someone has tried to access this poor Canadian's bank account and they'll think it's fraud or a scam or something. They won't know it's me here. So <laughs> I get so nervous about everything. I'm so careful, timid little mouse when it comes to finances. But it worked. I had no issues at all. And then, you know, going to an, AT going to an ATM, going to a bank, withdrawing money is always, uh, you know, your, your senses are heightened. And uh, I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. But while I'm there, the money came out and I'm counting the money to make sure the right amount. 
And of course, you're thinking that here you are counting this relatively large amount of money. And now everyone within iShot knows, okay, that guy, he's worth robbing. So it kind of puts a spotlight on me, right? So I'm sort of looking around, you know, making sure. And while I was doing that, this older man came up to use the ATM next to me. But instead of lining up exactly on his ATM, you know, like a good arm's length apart from me, he came up right beside me, like shoulder to shoulder. And then he kind of went in at his ATM on an angle because he had all these bags with him and an umbrella and he was trying to put them down in between the two ATMs. And I'm like, buddy, you're, you're, you're in my personal ATM space here. This is not normal. Like why? And it kind of felt like he was like getting in there to see what I was doing. And anyway, it just made me suspicious of him. Anyway, things like that. Uh, you know, you're just aware of things. And what I wanted to do was count my money, put it away, put away my Canadian ATM, put it somewhere safe. And that's also a question, where is safe? And I have a story about that in a minute. Like, should I put it in my wallet? I'm very worried about putting anything valuable in my wallet because the wallet is the most easy thing to lose because I'll go into a 7-Eleven to buy a carton of milk and I take out my wallet. You know, maybe someone, maybe I put it down on the counter and I leave it there. I forget it, I drop it, I lose it. Like the wallet is the easiest thing for you to, uh, to lose, you know? So you could also put it inside your knapsack, which to me feels more secure. I normally do that. I put it deep, deep in a hidden pocket inside my knapsack along with my ATM card. But the, I think the backpack is a target of snatch thieves. You know, guys that go by on a motorcycle or something, they target knapsacks. So that's also a dangerous place to put it. Anyway, so you have to make a choice about where to put this. This time I put it in my wallet. And then, before I put my wallet away, I took out my bank card from Taiwan. And that's kind of a funny one too, because that card has two PIN numbers. You have a national PIN number that like if I was in Taiwan, that's the one you use at the ATM but they also have an international number. And you use your international number when you're overseas. So you have two different pin numbers. You gotta keep that straight. So, there I am with my bank card from Taiwan, thinking, oh, this is ridiculous. Why am I even trying? And I put it into the machine and it started the normal process. You know, you hear the clunk, 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 clunk. And it says, you know, we are verifying your machine you're verifying your card and then it said you know, enter your pin I was like wow I got that far I kept expecting to be rejected and I, I knew the um, international pin put that in and um, I was in it seemed to be still working and I could you know choose between withdrawal or bal you know, account balance and I chose account balance and it worked the account after, yeah, 10, 11 years is still active and I almost never use it. I never put money into it. I never take money out of it. And yet it was still active and uh, I still had a balance. Unbelievable, like absolutely amazing. And for me, I was thinking about this a lot in my life. I think about it all the time. But this is another small example of why life in this part of the world is just better. It's just better in so many ways, better than being in Canada. Like I said, I told the story about my Canadian bank account. I had two bank accounts in Canada because I wanted to make sure I had a backup. I have money in both of them. If one card won't work, the other one will work. But the uh, second bank account, I guess I lost track of it a little bit and uh, I went to check, I went to uh, withdraw some money from it and uh, it was gone, just gone. You know, the bank saw that no money was flowing in and out of this account regularly and I guess they were charging these monthly fees that I talked about 
and they just uh, shut it down. So that bank account is gone and it disappears within a very short amount of time. And by contrast, here is this my bank account from Taiwan, which has basically been relatively unused for 10 years, has a small amount of money in it. <laughs> it's still there, still operating, still functional. That's just amazing. And stuff like that happens all the time where life here, everything, you know, to do with transportation, to do with accommodation, to do with money, everything is just, in my experience, simpler and easier. Just, yeah, just nicer. This is, this is the place to live. And that's an interesting thing to say because uh, yesterday I got a message from Wander Eats Daryl on WhatsApp and he sent me a link to an article talking about a new Canadian digital nomad visa. And I haven't done a, a deep dive into this, so I don't have all the details yet. I don't know if there are firm details at all. It seems to be like a brand new thing. It's something that the Canadian government just announced. It's like one or two days old and all the nuts and bolts of the program may not be in place yet. But according to the articles I read, yeah, Canada wants to get in on the digital nomad market. And I think their idea is a lot of people who are digital nomads are technical. They have technical skills, coders, that sort of thing. People who work with computers and programming because that kind of work can be done in other countries remotely. And Canada is thinking, well, we want these people in Canada. Um, yeah. And as I was reading about this digital nomad visa for Canada, it seems very uh, relaxed compared to the requirements in other countries. This Canadian one seems very, very relaxed. And as I'm uh, reading about it and, and why they came up with this program, one of the things I talked about is that if you enter Canada on this digital nomad visa, you can look for work locally. So if a company in Canada offers you a real job, you can take it on this visa. And then I guess it, you begin a process of transferring from a nomad visa to like a residency visa, a work permit, whatever it's called in Canada. So their idea is with this digital nomad visa, they can get all these people from all over the world with technical skills and they all come into Canada to take advantage of this digital nomad visa and suddenly we've got thousands and thousands of highly skilled technical workers backpacking around Canada and they'll start getting jobs in all these Canadian companies and suddenly we have this big workforce of highly skilled people. I don't know, seems like a... Hello? Uh, what's that? Oh, no, thank you. I'm okay. Uh, do you have a TikTok? No, this TikTok. is for uh, YouTube. Oh, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube. Can I? Inside? Well, sure. <laughs> I'm still recording right Hello. now. Hello, <laughs> I'm from Malaysia. I said this is Falcon. You can follow me at the TikTok, okay? Okay. It's uh, very good. You, okay. sell, you sell it. Where do you yeah, sell it? Uh, here in Malaysia. Okay. I also have a product, uh, Sambal Ratu Putri. Uh, I have a sister, it's a Ratu Paradiva. Okay, I'm a Putri, and you can also follow me at the TikTok Putri Kayangan Puri. Okay. Okay, <laughs> if you want to come to Malaysia, you also can uh, see me. I also uh, as a celebrity chef. All right. Yeah. Okay, it's I all on your... Mega cook, video cook. It's all on your TikTok. <laughs> ah, nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet okay, you, too. Inshallah, in next time, uh, we also can see you again. Okay, okay? no problem. Okay, ta-ta. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, a random encounter with a local uh, TikToker. And uh, yeah, I, I, I had a little bit of trouble making out what she was saying. But maybe on the video, you can understand the name of her TikTok uh, channel, things like that. Yeah, TikTok is a bit of a mystery to me. I, I've never downloaded TikTok. I don't have a TikTok account, so 
I'm, I'm out of the loop as far as uh, TikTok goes. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, the Canadian uh, Digital Nomad Visa. Seems like a good idea. And from the details I've been able to find so far, it's a short visa, yet easy to get. So it's six months long. And uh, I, I did click on the official link to go to the application page, but it didn't seem to be working. I did not see an application form for the Nomad visa. There are all kinds of other visas, but I didn't see that one. So maybe it's just not there yet, but it will be eventually. So I don't know the official requirements yet, but in all the articles, the one thing they stressed, which was amazing to me, is that there's no minimum income requirement. You don't have to prove that you're making a lot of money. And that's the requirement for most countries. I mean, a lot of people tell me, oh, you should apply for the, you know, digital nomad visa for Malaysia or for Thailand. But there's no way because I don't make any money. <laughs> You know, you have to prove that you have a real job and you're making X number of thousands of dollars per month as a remote worker, and then they will give you the digital nomad visa. So that's the barrier that I run into every time. But in Canada, according to what I read, they don't care. You can, and, and they also, in the uh, description, they actually list YouTuber as an acceptable category. I think for most countries, I mean, the YouTuber would not be considered a good enough job for this. You would have to be a more professional person than that. Just having a YouTube channel doesn't mean you're a, uh, you know, skilled remote worker. But for this Canadian nomad visa, apparently they accept um, anyone with a YouTube channel that is monetized, I assume. I don't know if you have to prove any of this but you don't have to prove that you make above a threshold of money. So, yeah, seems like it's a, a visa that would be easier to get than in most countries. So I thought that was really uh, kind of interesting. It makes me think of long ago, again, long, long ago, I was traveling across Canada. I did a bike ride across Canada and I ended up in the Rocky Mountains just as winter was arriving and I stopped at a ski resort and applied for a job like for the winter and I got a job at the ski resort because they hire you know seasonal workers they only need them in the winter time but they don't need them in the summer so whoa, I have a uh, crosswalk symbol I might as well take advantage of it so I got a job at the ski resort and I discovered that a lot of the people who were doing this were from Japan and other countries because they came into Canada on a, uh, what do they call those? I forget the name of them. Like if you're below like 25 years old, you can enter Canada and get jobs. So you can work on this visa. It's not technically a work visa. It's like a travel work visa, but it's only available to people, to young people. And you, know, you can't get it in your fifties, you know. So I had all these young people in Canada getting jobs at the ski resorts just for the winter. And uh, yeah, they could ski all winter long for free while working in the local gift shop at the ski resort or something like that. So there's all these people from Japan in particular, I remember doing this kind of work. So this digital nomad visa kind of reminds me of that, that it's you know relatively easy to get. You don't have to fulfill a lot of um, requirements. So yeah. Check into it. Canadian digital nomads. And I was thinking about this nomad visa in Canada and how easy it is to get. I think it is easy to get because I was just saying that everything in Canada is more difficult and that everything in this part of the world is easier, right? How my bank account from Taiwan is still operational after 10 years. Um, yeah, that would never happen in Canada. And yet this digital nomad visa seems to be an exception that this visa for Canada is easier to get than in other countries. Though of course the catch is, I think, that most people who want to work remotely, they want to go to really exotic, interesting countries, which Canada 
Anyway, from my point of view, it's not that exotic or particularly interesting. But they also want to go to countries with a lower cost of living. So you can earn money online, say in US dollars, but you can live in Nepal where living expenses are very low and life is very interesting. And Canada, of course, is a very expensive place. Just, just living there costs a fortune. So, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how attractive it would be to remote workers looking for an inexpensive place to live. But as I was chatting with uh, Daryl, it occurred to me that this visa would probably be very popular amongst backpackers because if it's really easy to get, you know, just like a tourist visa, for example, then it's like a shortcut to getting a six month tourist visa. You know, you're a YouTuber, you've got a YouTube channel, you know, become a, just tell them you're a digital nomad, you're a remote worker, get a six month visa and travel all around country, all around the country as a backpacker. And essentially you got a six month tourist visa. So I can see a lot of people doing that. Anyway, it's early days. It's a brand new program just announced. So I don't know what's uh how it's going to turn out reality there could be a catch with all these things for me anyway there's always a catch but we'll see if there is one uh in this case in the last video i talked quite a bit about using different microphones different audio sources uh, connected to the gopro and it occurs to me that my encounter with the the woman with the uh, tiktok channel <clears throat> is a good example of that because right now I'm recording with the Rode Wireless Go, which is, and I have the microphone here around my neck underneath my shirt. And it's very good at picking up my voice, I think, and balancing my voice with the ambient sound, you know, the traffic around me and that sort of thing. But when I'm talking to another person, like I ran into her, and she wanted me to put her on the video, and then I hold the GoPro away, you know, to have me in the video and maybe whoever I'm talking to. But I'm pretty sure the road is still only picking up my voice. She's over here talking and the microphone can't pick up her voice from that distance. And that's the issue with any lavalier mic because the road is designed to be a lavalier mic. It's not designed to pick up all the sound around me. It's designed to pick up the sound, the voice of the person wearing it which is what a lav mic does. So, yeah, so that's kind of the, um, the problem I was trying to solve when I was testing Daryl's uh, Deity D4 mini microphone, a shotgun mic, because then you're getting audio from two sources, from here and then from the shotgun mic. But I don't know if that would work either because the issue with uh, shotgun mics in my experience is that they don't pick up sound from very far away. In order for them to sound good, they have to be really close to your mouth. And my Boya, if I hold it out here, it won't even pick up my voice. Uh, the Deity is much better, like from right this distance, it will pick up the sound of my voice pretty clearly. It's better at distance than the Boya. But then if there's someone standing over here and I'm holding the GoPro over here, that's far away from the shotgun mic. And I don't know if it would pick up that person's voice. Yeah, audio is uh, tough to do. It really is when you're just out in the wild, you know, walking around like this. Something else that has been on my mind recently is music. I used to listen to a lot of music, particularly when traveling. Uh, when I was cycling or traveling in a bus or doing anything like that, I would be listening to music. But in modern times, I don't anymore. Music has been replaced by uh, podcasts. So I listen to podcasts now when in other times I would have been, you know, listening to music. But recently, whatever, for whatever reason on YouTube, I stumbled across a YouTube channel forget the name of it now, but the name is not important. But it's a guy who posted videos about pop music, rock and roll and, you know, popular music. And what he, the very first video I stumbled across, he posted a video of the 
most recognizable songs from every year from 1950 to 2023. So, uh, yeah, I, I, and it wasn't the entire song, of course, because that would end up being way too, uh, way too long. But what he did was just play 10 seconds of each song just so that you could recognize what song it is. So this is the most recognizable song of 1950, then 1951, 52, you know, all the way up until uh, 2023. And oh, I just love the video and being reminded of all these songs that I knew quite well. You know, again, you know, I wasn't born in the 50s, but I know music from the 50s, of course. So all that music was uh, very familiar to me. And then all the music from 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And of course, whether it's true or not, um, it felt like music fell off a cliff around 2003. Like all the music was amazing and I loved all of it right up until we got to the 2000s. And there was occasionally a little bit of good music, but after 2000, I don't know, music just died or something. It was like music was great all the way up until the 90s. And then somehow in 2003 or 2005, I don't know what happened to music, but it just became just corporate, felt like computer manufactured pop that, I don't know, just has no heart, no soul. I just, you know, all the modern music I've been listening to, I just can't get into it. But uh, it was really a lot of fun reliving all the music from the past decades. So I started listening to music more and more. And uh, it occurred to me, getting into a technology, that I have some, uh, I have another device that I could use to listen to music. Before I got my current smartphones, I was using uh, iPods, you know. When I was living in Taiwan, I was heavily into iPods. I had the iPod Shuffles, the iPod Minis, and the iPod Nano. I think the iPod Nano was the last one that I bought. And I remembered that I still had my iPod Nano. It was in storage here in Kuala Lumpur. So I dug it out of storage, and there it is. <laughs> so I started with, this is my iPod Nano. Beautiful little machine, um, and it still had a lot of my favorite music in memory. All I needed to do was charge up the battery. Still works fine. Battery lasts a long time. The audio quality on these little machines is amazing when you combine it with a good set of uh, earphones. So yeah, I kind of blew the dust off my iPod Nano and I've been enjoying music in that. But then um, I ran into a few problems with the Nano. Uh, one is that the, uh, the main menu button, for some reason, is not as responsive as it used to. I have it inside this protective case, and I think the case is interfering with how the um, scroll wheel operates, and I can't get it out of the case. It, like, clicks into place, and I've been trying and trying and trying, using all my strength, and I can't get it out of the case. So I don't know whether I can fix that or not. But the other issue, of course, is that there isn't a whole lot of memory. There's eight gigabytes of memory, and I guess that's a lot for music. But my music library is a lot larger than eight gigabytes. My whole music library is about 90, 85, I think 85 gigabytes in total. And uh, I couldn't really load, you know, 85 gigabytes onto my current smartphones because I use them for other things. You know, I use them for editing videos and for you know, reframing 360 videos, things like that. So I can't really use up 85 gigs of memory in one of my day-to-day -day phones. Plus, I don't really like doing that. I like having devices that are single use only. It's like if I take my main smartphone and I use it for listening to music all the time, then when I need it as an actual smartphone, it'll be out of power, right? I like to have a phone that I know has a fully charged battery and it's ready to go when I need it. You know, Google Maps and things like that. Booking hotel rooms, online banking, booking flights. You know, that's what I use that phone for. 
and I don't want to turn it into a music player also because using it as a music player increases the security risk because then you always have it out you always have it sitting on the table you're in a coffee shop you know you're listening to music your phone which you're, you use for all your online accounts <clears throat> is now vulnerable a lot more than it would have been before so I like to have a dedicated music player if I can so I started thinking about that and then I remembered that I also have an old iPhone SE and um, this was given to me by a, a uh, Planet Doug subscriber and uh, you know he had he had this uh, iPhone brand new still in a box you know with all the accessories and all the documentation everything and he wasn't using it at all because he you know he'd upgraded to the more modern phones and switched over to Samsung I think he was you know using the latest Samsung Galaxy <clears throat> and he had this iPhone SE and he put it in the mail and uh, shipped it to me and I've used it for things for, you know from time to time I thought it would be very useful because I also have a MacBook an Apple product and I thought at least having one iPhone would be handy maybe it can do things with the MacBook that an Android phone can't do I can connect them together and so anyway, I've kept the iPhone SE, like the very, the very first one that came out. So, yeah. And um, in case uh, you need to be reminded, <laughs> I'm having trouble concentrating just because there is uh, so much traffic and so many intersections. It's pretty noisy right here. I think I'm gonna walk up this road just to take a little detour while I'm rambling. Yeah, the, uh, like I said, the traffic lights here, they're all out. So, I don't know where anybody's going. And people have turn signals on, but they're not actually turning. So I'm very confused a lot of times. Anyway, ooh, where, I've got a whole bunch of black stuff on my phone. Where did that come from? Ah, okay, well, there it is. So there is my iPhone SE and it was absolutely immaculate in perfect condition untouched suddenly I don't know it's got all this black stuff on the back I just had it in my pocket anyway so I don't know where that came from but anyway it's essentially brand new very small very very lightweight and it's a beautiful little device I mean it's just gorgeous feels so good in the hand and it has 128 gigabytes of internal memory no removable SD card or anything like that. But, like I said, wow. <laughs> Yikes, it does have 128 gigabytes of internal memory. So I, I loaded my entire music library into iTunes on my iPhone SE. And that's what I'm using now to listen to music, which is good. It's like a very small device, very elegant, long battery life, you know, for the way I use it. And uh, so I, I love having it, lots of memory. The only problem for me is that it is an Apple product and I'm not, I'm not that happy with the whole Apple ecosystem. I just don't get it. It takes a lot of control away from the user. I kind of prefer the Windows Android approach where you have more control over what the device is doing so in this case, in order to put music on the iPhone, what I ended up doing was putting it on my MacBook first and loading everything into iTunes on my MacBook and making sure the entire music library was organized, you know, with all the album art, every, you know, each album was, you know, organized and together and working properly. And then I transferred it from the MacBook to my iPhone, you know, just connected my iPhone to the computer and then you sync them together and your music gets copied over to your iPhone. Though they don't call it copying in the, in the Apple world, it's always syncing. And I never, I don't quite understand the language some of the time. And uh, yeah, so this took a long time transferring, you know, that many gigabytes of anything and uh, doing it on iTunes and this sort of thing takes a long time. Oh, this is interesting, by the way. 
this is an interesting street. You're at, you know, in a very uh, historic part of Kuala Lumpur, kind of at the base of uh, the Eco Park, you know? And here's, uh, yeah, St. John's School. I see a lot of students coming from St. John's School every day. And somewhere around here, I think this building here is sort of a, an art display complex of some kind is, is in here somewhere. I've never gone inside of it. I've just seen it on Google Maps. And then here's another uh, church property, very interesting building. I don't know the history of, uh... oh yeah, there's the convent in Bukit Nanas Chapel, five minutes this way. I think I can see the roof of the chapel over there. So yeah, there are Christian uh, churches in this area. And I, I'm assuming this is a Christian school as well. So yeah, it's quite an interesting neighborhood. A lot of uh, KL history here. But by the time I finished transferring all my music onto the iPhone into iTunes, the first time I did it, everything got screwed up. The transfer didn't work properly. None of the albums were like organized. Everything was a mess. There were tons of duplicates I didn't know how to get rid of. And once that happens in iTunes, ooh, check this out. Oh, okay. School. Menenga St. John School. Look at that. Yeah, it's a big part of uh, Kale history too. Just stop walking for a second. Oh, I probably, I better get out of here soon. St. John's International Primary School. Look at that. What an amazing building. Look at the clock tower. A lot of history here. I didn't know I was coming up in this direction. If I knew, I would have done some reading and would have known a few things about the age of this building and when it was built. But uh, I didn't know I was coming here, so I can't tell you anything about the place right now other than uh, what you can see. Yeah, very interesting. And there's the uh, KL Tower up there. But yeah, when I did the first transfer, iTunes got completely screwed up and all I could do was wipe it out. I basically deleted the entire library and started all over from scratch. And I did it the second time very carefully and deliberately. And this time all the music got transferred over properly and uh, sorted into all of the um, proper albums, which was great, but unfortunately, about half of the album artwork just didn't show up. So the album is there, it's got all the songs in the album, it's all organized correctly, as the name of the, of the artist, everything's organized properly. But for whatever reason, the album art is just not there, and you just get the iTunes music note, you know, the default cover. So that kind of annoys me, because I do have all the album art for every single album, but I, whatever I do, I can't seem to get it to show up on my iPhone. So. But to me, that's how iTunes works. iTunes has never worked for me. It's just such a pain in the butt. The whole, your whole music database can just explode out of nowhere. You don't know why, you don't know what happened. And you gotta rebuild the whole thing again and again. Which is why I kind of, I kind of prefer the Android approach. I just copy all the folders over. You know, I just put all my music on, organized by folder. And then I, anytime I wanna watch an album, or listen to some songs by Bob Seger. I just open the Bob Seger folder and there's all the Bob Seger albums, you know, and I just open the one I want and listen to it. I like having that control. iTunes is supposed to, you know, organize everything for you and then using tags, you know, and make everything perfect and beautiful and automated. But when it takes that control away from the user and then it doesn't work, there's just no way to fix it. So for me, that's iTunes iTunes has always been a nightmare. But anyway, that is what I'm doing now. I have all of my music on this lovely um, Apple iPhone SE. And uh, so I've been listening to a lot of great music the last few days. So yeah, that was really cool. And uh, see some thoughts about YouTube stories and online stories. 
In the other video, I told a very long story about the mountaineer from Malaysia, Ravi Everest, who was at the center of a controversy about a month ago. Very interesting story. And today I was doing a little bit more poking around. I was curious if there was anything new on his Instagram page and on his Facebook page. And, it, and I was saying in the first story that Ravi Everest was quite interesting because he took the high road where he was under attack on the internet. A lot of articles being written that were critical of him, a lot of random anonymous attackers online, you know, leaving comments all over the place saying terrible things about him. And he really didn't bother to try and uh, defend himself or reply to anyone. He just took the high road and just ignored all of that as online nonsense and just said, eh. And he stay, I assume he stayed within his mountaineering group. And of course, all his fellow mountaineers would know the real story of what happened. And he's, you know, again, I'm just thinking like Ravi, he was probably thinking, listen, my friends and my family, they know the truth. They know me. What do I care what, you know, hundreds of thousands of people around the world that I don't know think about me. I'll just leave that alone and ignore it. So that was his approach, I think. But it kind of, I guess, got a bit overwhelming because when I checked his Instagram page, now it had been set to private. So you couldn't see anything unless you follow him. You have to be like a follower of his Instagram page. And of course, he has to approve you as a follower in order for you to comment or see any of his posts. So he's basically set that to private. So random weirdos from all over the world can't leave crazy comments anymore. And then I went to his Facebook page and his Facebook page was still open and active, but I guess there's a setting in Facebook where you can say that the only people who can leave comments have to have been following you for at least 24 hours. So people can't just click on his Facebook page and then leave a bunch of horrible comments. They have to follow his page and follow it for where am I? Oh, this is interesting. Anyway, they have to follow it for 24 hours and then they can leave a comment. So of course that filters out 99% of the craziness because random attackers in social media aren't going to go to that much trouble to leave a, you know, a horrible comment. So, but he still had, you could still see what he was posting. You just couldn't comment on it unless you were already a follower. Yeah, I just kind of reacted like, oh, because I've never gone over this bridge before. I've always walked underneath it. This, as far as I know, is the uh, Malaysian uh, Stock Exchange building right over there. Quite an impressive building. And this is the uh, Olympia Tower on this side, the Manara Olympia. And I've always been impressed by the top of this building. You can't see it from here. But if you click on this building on Google Maps, you can see some pictures of this tower, of, of its architecture. And the top has like a big round, almost like a crown. And it's an older building, of course, you can tell just the way it looks, a bit worn. But uh, yeah, quite impressive, that top area. And I've often wondered what's up there. Like, can a member of the public just ride an elevator to the top? I really don't know. But. Um, yeah, and there's the, uh, the Maybank building. That's where I went to uh, withdraw money. And I found out that my Taiwan bank account is still active, which is good news. But yeah, I've never gone in this direction. I have to kind of, oh yeah, oh, that's exactly where it goes. Okay, I know how to get back. Cool. But anyway, so I went to Ravi Everest's Facebook page and you can't comment there, but you can still see his posts and he has some interesting ones there because, yeah, he has a very interesting story. He's climbed Everest three times, and on, I think, his second attempt, I think it was his second one, on his way up, he started to feel his fingers going numb, and he kind of ignored it. He didn't do anything about it, and it turns out that his fingers froze solid, and he developed frostbite. By the time he realized what was happening, it was too late and he lost the tips, I believe, of all of his fingers. The tips of all eight fingers had to be surgically amputated 
because of frostbite. So that was on one of his Everest climbs before. And on his most recent climb, where he had to be rescued and carried down off the mountain, he suffered more frostbite. Frostbite in his back, he said. And he, got, he, he was suffering quite a bit on his fingers. And uh, he wrote earlier that when he had surgery on his fingers before to cut off the tips, there wasn't much flesh left to go over the top of the bones. And that led to getting frostbite more easily in the future. So what he needed to do was have another surgery to cut back on the bones, cut away the bone, but leave the flesh and kind of fold it over the top and give some more cushioning around the bone, basically. So I don't know whether he had that surgery or not, but in a picture on his Facebook page, he had a photo of himself standing there with both hands completely bandaged up, like his fingers were all bandaged up. So he's still healing from his last Everest expedition. But he, he looks very happy. He looks very, uh, f like, full of energy. And he's got his thumbs in the air, you know, both thumbs. And in his other post before that one, he was announcing a trek to the Everest base camp that I guess he's, he's either organizing or he's even guiding this trek. So it's open to anybody to join, and he's advertising the trek to Everest Base Camp. And, uh, oh yeah, I was going to push the, uh, the walk button, but it's not going to do any good. There's, uh, the traffic lights aren't working, so I got to uh, time this very carefully. Uh, cars come down off this hill pretty fast. There we go, big opening. No problem. Oh yeah, looks like I can... Uh, oops, I was going to get across, but... It's one of the hop-on, hop-off buses. This is a really tricky corner, I find, because you have to go around this, but you can't see what's on the other side. And, pe and cars are like whipping around this corner very quickly. So you gotta get to this corner right here and just sort of poke your head around and make sure it's safe. And then uh, and I head over to the, uh, the divider because there's no sidewalk over there. There's nowhere to walk. Yeah, this uh, trek to Everest Base Camp is in November, I think, yeah. And he's, you know, advertising it and people are signing up to go on this trek. And somebody asked him how much it cost and he said 1,150 US dollars. That's probably just for the trek. Starting from, you know, the beginning of the trek to base camp and back again. But the flight to Nepal and hotels in Kathmandu, that sort of thing. I think that's extra. You would have to pay for all that yourself. The 1150 is just for the trek itself, which is like 10 days or something like that. <laughs> okay, I'm back at this intersection. Whew. Of course, it doesn't help that I'm talking into the GoPro all this time. I almost need all of my attention just to see where I'm going in terms of the traffic. So yeah, that's kind of the end of the story of a Ravi Everest, a little epilogue there. He seems happy. He's on his way back. He's organizing a trek in the Himalayas. And I think he has more mountaineering, like serious, like climbing big mountains around the world. He's planning all kinds of things for next year, 2024. So he's uh, recovering from his injuries and he's going to uh, continue mountain climbing. And I'm almost back at my hotel again. The last few minutes, maybe I'll do a pop culture roundup. I've seen some interesting shows recently. The one that's been on my mind the most is a new show called Silo. Science fiction, of course. I, I tend to, I gravitate towards anything 
uh, science fiction related. Hi. Hello. And uh, yeah, Silo just finished. They had their finale just a few nights ago. I liked it. I mean, overall, thumbs up approval. I think it's a good show. I think it's worth watching. It's a thinker, definitely a thinker. You have to keep your, you have to pay attention and keep your wits about you. It's also a bit of a slow burn. You have to uh, have confidence that everything that's happening means something. You know, even if you don't understand it right away, you have to have confidence that later in the show, you'll eventually learn what all this is about because you see all these things that you don't understand, you don't know what's going on, and it could be quite frustrating to a certain type of viewer, but you have to understand it's that kind of show that you will, things will be revealed eventually. You just have to be patient and wait for the information to uh, come out. And I have to be honest, I cheated because I watched the first three or four episodes and I was a little bit frustrated with it because there were some things I didn't understand and it was really bothering me because, I don't know, they were so important. The show didn't really do a good job of giving you enough information to really sink your hooks into the story and be engaged. It was hard to care about it because it just seemed like that doesn't make any sense at all. I don't understand what's going on. So I kind of gave up on the show, but I wanted to know what was going to happen. So I went online and I read summaries of all the books because the TV show is based on a book series. So I just went on to the internet and I found plot summaries of every book and I read the whole storyline. And once I did that and I knew what was really going on, then it was like, oh, okay. Now all that makes sense. And now I'm invested. And even though I knew the whole story, there were no more secrets, I still went back to the show and I enjoyed it even more now that I knew what was going on, you know? It's like the way they wrote the show itself, they had to be very careful about what they showed, you know, what they told the viewers and uh, what they didn't. They had to get a real balance and for my opinion, they kind of erred on the side of not telling the viewers enough to keep your attention. So that's where I, I kind of lost interest in the show. And then, uh, yeah, once you know what's going on, it's like, ah, oh. and I stuck in, stuck with it all the way to the end. And uh, not to give anything away, I should say something about the plot. It's all in the trailer, what I'm about to say. It's basically about a group of 10,000 people who are living underground in a kind of silo. So it's basically a round building, like a silo, that 10,000 people live in, like a, a community. And they're on, it's all, it all goes deep underground. I think something like 166 floors underground. And each level, you know, it's like a, a city or something like that. So some levels are dedicated to agriculture and that's where they grow all their food. Other layers are, you know, dedicated to the judicial system or IT or mechanical or, you know, power generation. It's like a, like a large city, but built vertically underground. And the people in the silo don't know where they are. They like, they don't really know why they're there. They don't know who built the silo. They only have vague rumors and stories, you know, that they can uh, depend on because this is all post-apocalypse. You know, basically the world has been wiped out in some kind of a apocalypse, whether thermonuclear war or some sort of biological devastation, a pandemic that wiped out the human race or something. Something happened and the remaining survivors of the human race are now living underground in this silo. So that's the setting for the story. And you can imagine a story like that, a setting like that would be like catnip to me. Um, I'm fascinated with uh, stories like that. I'm almost uh, back at my hotel. In fact, I walked right by my hotel because I wasn't finished uh, talking about silo yet. But this is where I am now. This is the river. And this is all uh, kind of another little India. 
near Masjid Jamek. My hotel is right there, the red sign, Oyo sign. And it's raining, not very heavily though, so I'm okay. And the other thing I thought the show could have done better on was um, really conveying the situation of these people in the silo. And I don't think I'm giving anything away here because I think the show wants you to understand this right from the beginning. But somehow, when I watched the show, I didn't understand this at all. It wasn't until episode five or something like that there was a scene, and in that scene, they explained something, and I went, oh, oh, now I get it. Now, okay, that's what's going on. And once I knew that, it changed the entire character of the show for me. It was like, oh, I wish I, and I think thinking back, you're supposed to know this, like they're, they're intending you to understand this. But somehow for me, Maybe I was like, sometimes I watch shows with half my brain because I'm busy doing something else with the other half. Maybe I wasn't paying enough attention. But this thing that I'm talking about, um, if you don't want to know anything about the show and you're worried I might spoil something, you know, leave the video now. So fair warning for, I don't think this is a spoiler. As I said, I think you're supposed to know this. They just didn't do a good job of explaining it to me. And this fact is, Spoiler, that the people in the silo have zero knowledge of the world, right? Like nothing. I thought they knew about the apocalypse and I thought they knew about what the way, how the world was in the past because they have computers, they have technology. So I just thought they knew how the world used to be, that they knew about the oceans, forests, mountains, cities, cars, the internet. You know, I thought they knew about the old world because they're living in the silo and they know that if they go outside, they die. Anyone who leaves the silo, the air will kill them. I assume because there's a biological agent still active, like the pandemic. So they know they can't go outside and they live inside the silo. But I thought they knew what the world used to be like and that they were all wishing they could go outside and rebuild the old world. But it turns out that they don't know anything. They have zero knowledge of anything outside the silo. They didn't know what the world used to be like. They didn't know there were oceans out there. They'd never seen an ocean or a tree. Uh, well, they did see a tree now that I think about it, a dead one. But yeah, they didn't know what was out there. So they had no knowledge of anything that existed you know, before they, you know, they were born inside the silo and they grew up inside the silo and that's all they know, you know, they don't know anything else. And I didn't realize that. Oh, the key, the key example that I learned, it came from this scene where there was a man, they have a view screen, like they actually have one video camera outside the silo where they can see a little bit of ground and the sky. That's all they can see. And at night, you can see the stars. And this man was sitting there looking at the view screen, looking at the stars, but it became apparent he didn't know what they were. For him, they were just lights, like lights, like a, like a light bulb, like lights in the sky. Like he wouldn't even know what the sky was, but he wasn't aware of stars. He had never heard of stars and he didn't know about stars. So all these people living in the silo they didn't even have that knowledge. They didn't know about stars and moons and planets, the sun. They didn't know about any of those things. And I think you're supposed to understand that from the beginning of the show, but somehow I didn't pick up on it until much, much later. I thought they knew about the outside world. I thought they had knowledge of science and geography and history and physics, and, but no, they didn't know anything. So that was quite interesting. Rain's coming down harder. Check this out, got quite a large, uh, He's not gonna look big on the GoPro, but there's a very large monitor lizard down there. Uh, five feet long, maybe. Four and a half, five feet long. Meter and a half. Yeah, big, big guy. Lives in the river. And uh, yeah, here's ABC Bistro Cafe. <laughs> 
I've been trying to get meals in these places and I haven't been very successful. <laughs> Service is very uh, casual, to put it mildly. And I'm not aggressive enough to get service in a place like that. Anyway. So I think that is it for this video. And that is it for uh, my pop culture update. I have a whole bunch of other pop culture things I could talk about. But I think I'll leave it with, um, I'll leave it with uh, Silo. And uh, leave the rest for another day. But yeah, overall, overall. I recommend Silo if you're into science fiction. Kind of Black Mirror style storytelling. That's what it's like. Yeah, I like that a lot. All right. I'm back in my current temporary home. It started to rain more and more out there. Got a little bit of a wet hair, but I, I got inside before the uh, downpour really started. And I realized I had one more story I wanted to tell. And it connects with what I was talking about earlier, and it connects with this, my wallet. Because I was talking about how I was at, you know, Maybank, and I withdrew some Malaysian ringgit from my bank account in Canada, which is now all in here. <laughs> and my ATM card, the only one that I have that has any money in the account, is also in here. And I was talking when I was at the ATM about how these days you hear a lot of stories online that make you realize that when you withdraw money from a bank, when you come out of a bank, people could be watching you. They could be targeting you because anyone that comes out of a bank, there's a good chance they've just withdrawn some money. And if you're at an ATM, of course, they can actually see, ah, he's withdrawn some money and then that they could set you up for a robbery. I'm not one of these paranoid people. I'm not looking for danger in every direction, but you know, you can make choices to make things better for yourself. So when I was at the ATM, you know, I was talking about that. Well, I can put money that I withdraw into my wallet and it feels like that could be safer because if I put it into my knapsack, thieves, target the knapsack, like a snatch thief. Someone who comes running up to you, you know, will grab the knapsack and run away with it or someone on a motorcycle. So to avoid that situation, you can put it in your wallet and they may, they may have a harder time getting your wallet from you, but then you run the risk of just losing your wallet because it's something you take out of your pocket all the time. So you're on your way back from the bank. I just came from the ATM and I'm passing a 7-Eleven. As I said, it's like, oh, I want a carton of milk. I go in there and I'm taking out my wallet to, you know, pay for the carton of milk. And then maybe I drop my wallet by accident. I put it on the counter and I forget it. The wallet is one of the easiest things for you to lose if, even if it's in a pocket that is more secure than your knapsack. You see what I mean? So there's pros and cons to all the different options. And I was thinking about this because I saw a video, a YouTuber, a travel vlogger. The channel is called Itchy Feet on the Cheap. It's a Canadian couple. Um, ooh, I forgot his name. I want to say Ryan and his wife or girlfriend, Sarah. They've been traveling a long time, going to a bunch of different countries. And they have a, a video on their channel called Robbed at Gunpoint in Ecuador. And exactly what I was talking about happened to them. Where um, I guess Sarah was working full time in Ecuador. She had a job, like a real job with a work visa and a monthly salary. And they had an apartment and, and all these kinds of things. And they were leaving Ecuador. And as as they were leaving, they were going to get her final pay. And it was a big paycheck. Two months salary plus an, a contract completion bonus. So it was a lot of money and they were moving to Cambodia. So I'm pretty sure they were counting on this money to help pay for the moving expenses and that sort of thing. And they were leaving in four days 
and they had to get all their visas. You know, she was going to a new job in Cambodia, so they're getting all their visas in advance. Everything was all stamped in their passport, and they were leaving the country in four days. But for some weird reason, I mean, he tells the whole story in the video, the school where she worked insisted that they had to close out their bank account because the bank account, I guess, was linked to the school for direct deposit of their salaries. And with the final payment, in order to get it, they had to close the bank account. Or the, the school gave them the money in cash? No, 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 they were at the bank. So they were at the bank, they got all this money, and the account was closed. They couldn't leave, that's the thing, they couldn't leave the money in the account. What they wanted to do was just have the money in the account and then do a wire transfer from that account to their account in Canada. That's what they would normally do. But in this case, they couldn't do the wire transfer because the school insisted that they had to close their bank account as soon on her last day. So they, they were forced to go to the bank, withdraw all of their money, close the bank account, and now they left the bank and they had all this money and Sarah's passport in Ryan's knapsack. They, they got into a grab, you know, they called a grab, and they took the grab back to their house, back to their apartment, and when the grab stopped at their apartment, then suddenly there were men there, and he doesn't have a lot of memory about exactly what happened. I guess it was so chaotic. He, he didn't really, he can't really explain what happened, but one door opened to the car, and the other door opened, and a man took a gun, put a gun in his face, and said, you know, give us the bag, you know, give us the knapsack. And then, you know, Jack, Orion, he tried to keep it, and had a little bit of a tug-of-war over it, but then another man came in from the other side, and I guess uh, Ryan got hit in the head. He didn't even remember getting hit, but he was sliced open here behind his ear, and he was bleeding, so they must have hit him maybe with the butt of the gun or something and he was knocked a little bit, you know, um, out, out of, uh, you know, he wasn't as focused anymore. He got hit in the head and the thieves grabbed the knapsack and ran. So chances are they knew the money was in the knapsack and, or they're taking a chance that the money was in the knapsack. So you can, yeah, you can hear the whole story where, you know, Ryan tells it. It's called Robbed at Gunpoint in Ecuador. And it was that story that I was thinking about when I was thinking about, okay, now I've withdrawn all this money. Well, not as much as they withdrew, but you know, a significant amount and my bank ATM is here. Normally what I would do is separate them. Like I wouldn't keep the money and the ATM in the, or the, I wouldn't keep the money and the ATM card in the same place. I would always separate them because in fact, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to lose the money that I'm hoping to use in Sumatra but it would be even more trouble if I lost the ATM card. It's actually more important to me in a way than the money that I have right now. So, you know, I would put the money in one place and the ATM card in the other. For today, for whatever reason, I just put it all in here and I put this in my pocket rather than the knapsack. But, uh, so if someone did, you know, what happened to Ryan, you know, where the guy came running up on him. If it, someone came running up on me with a gun and grabbed my knapsack and ran away, at least I'd still have this. And if it feels like this is easier for me to protect, this is in my pocket, and for them to get at my wallet is going to be a lot harder. You know, I can run away. They can't grab it. Like a knapsack is kind of vulnerable because they can grab it and hold you back. And the only way you can get away is by, you know, getting the straps off your shoulders and giving them the knapsack and you physically run away. But they can't really do that with the wallet, you know. Obviously, there are better solutions than either of those, of course. I mean, one would be for those situations where you go to an ATM and you withdraw a substantial amount of money, you can put it into a money belt under your clothes. And again, a determined thief can still get at it if they know it's there and they got a gun to your head, you know, and there's three men or something. Yeah, there's, they're, they're still going to get at the money belt, but it's a lot safer than a wallet or a knapsack. So you could put on a money belt for just that day, go to the ATM, get everything kind of ready in advance, put the money inside the money belt underneath your pants, underneath your shirt, and then you can walk out. I mean, that would be the best thing to do. But of course, you know, you can't live your life in fear 
day and night. You know, you can't be like looking for thieves everywhere. You, you just can't do it. You can't stay that focused all the time. You just have to develop certain safety habits, you know. So anyway, that's the last story I wanted to tell all about uh, itchy feet on the cheap and how, yeah, when they came from the bank, someone was targeting them. Um, if you read all the comments on that video, of course, everybody has advice for him about what he should have done and all the mistakes that he made, sort of blaming the victim kind of comments. It's kind of weird. People are trying to be helpful with those comments by giving you good advice, but then again, it comes across as blaming the victim. You know, you were the victim. You got robbed. Um, but if you made a mistake that made it easier for the robbers, then everyone kind of focuses on that. They don't talk about how the robber is a really bad person. They talk about how you made a mistake and it, it ends up kind of blaming the victim instead of blaming the thief, you know, and the, the, th the, the blame should go to the thief, obviously. Um, but so, yeah, these comments are meant, I think they're meant from a good place, trying to give good advice and good suggestions, but it does come across as uh, blaming the victim a little bit. But uh, yeah, so in his case, um, yeah, I was going to say that some of the comments are saying the school was probably in on it. That's why the school forced them to make this huge withdrawal and take all the money out of the bank. And then the, someone at the school knew they were going to do that, tipped off some people, and they were waiting at the bank, saw them, followed them home, and robbed them, you know, when the car stopped, you know, when they got home. So, uh, I mean, I doubt it personally. I think it was just someone who just does that for a living. They are in the parking lot of the bank all the time and they're just watching people and they see a couple of foreigners come out and they're like, ha, ah, I'll bet you they took, a, they took out some money and then they just took the knapsack and it just happened to be that Ryan did put the money and the passport and everything in the knapsack. So, yeah, the thieves uh, got lucky, you know, they, they really got a windfall that day. But, yeah, interesting story. I always find robbery stories to be interesting. They're very dramatic, you know, sort of the, uh, yeah, yeah, very ex bad things, but it's also a very interesting story. And to get at it from all the different angles, what exactly happened and lessons you can learn from it. So, but anyway, in this case... I made it back to the hotel safely, and um, I have a habit of if I ever use, I don't carry around my ATM card, I don't carry around a lot of money, I don't keep that in my wallet. My wallet is completely empty, except for a little bit of money that I need for that day. And I have my touch and go card in here, you know, but that's all I carry. I wouldn't carry an ATM with me all day. This stays locked up here in my room, which is the safest place for me. So as soon as I come in the door, the first thing I do is take everything out of my wallet or everything out of my knapsack and I put everything away where it's supposed to do, where it's supposed to go. That's the first thing I do when I come back. And it's just one of the habits I've developed rather than, you know, it's like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow morning or I'll, I'll do it later. No, you do it the very first thing and then you know you've done it. So that's my, one of my rules. I didn't do it right now because I wanted show and tell for the video. But as soon as I uh, stop the video, I'm going to uh, deal with this. You can see how fat it is. <laughs> there's, there's too much money, too many ATM cards in there. Yeah, I, I don't want that. Uh, I'm going to put all that away in a minute. All right, that's it. Planet Doug behind the scenes podcast, whatever you want to call this thing. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. And hopefully in one of these videos very soon, I can tell you how I'm getting to Sumatra. I still haven't decided but I have to decide uh, very soon.